Good evening and welcome to the Dollar Dogs and Beer Podcast. I am your host, Andrew, and joining me tonight, we've got Joe and back from, God, I don't know how many weeks it's been this time. Jason has finally decided to return and grace us with his presence. Uh, how you doing, dude? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Yeah, it, it's it's been a two weeks, three weeks, I guess. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, I won't be here next week because I'll be in Virginia. But Dude, um, <laughs> I know. Well, then have, tell you what, just don't have one next week and we'll do the hundredth next next time. Uh, or you can take your laptop with you. I mean, I think we we'll probably will have the laptop. I'll just hop in for a couple minutes, maybe just to just to celebrate. Joe, this guy's trouble, man. <laughs> Do you expect anything less? No. Nope. Exactly. <laughs> Especially not with a shirt like that. <laughs> That's a great shirt. Great shirt. Uh, hats off uh, to uh, the at 2008 Phils with a Z uh, Twitter handle. Uh, my guy, John. Uh, he's uh, running the newsletter and running that Twitter account like a champ. So, uh newsletter people could get the 2008 shirt for signing up so yeah <laughs> figure I go with something not a jersey this week <laughs> i got nothing so <laughs> joe what are you drinking tonight dude <laughs> uh well you know it, if things had gone a little better this weekend i was gonna pop in yingling for the phillies but uh, that's not happening so uh, <laughs> Because Sorry, I, man. Because I think something's wrong in David Ross's skull, which we'll get to later. Broken Skull American Lager from El Segundo Brewing. Uh, Steve Austin's Broken our Skull. Bu- our buddy Lager. Jim will be very happy to see that. He sure will be. <laughs> yeah, it's one of his go-tos. I know that. Um, Jason, what are you drinking tonight? So I am out of beer at the moment. Um until I can go down and get some more of that cheer wine ale uh, starting this coming weekend. So I have some uh, red wine from Grandview Vineyards. It is a 2018 uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So uh, it is, I love dry red wines. It's actually good for you too. So um, <laughs> it's just a glass, baby. So. Uh, going with a, a glass of dry red wine tonight. <laughs> so it's Dollar Dogs and wine. Yeah, so much that brings back to beer. So uh, what I'm that would be like a great name for a podcast for just like ranting about the bad things that happen in baseball. Oh God, <laughs> Dollar Dogs and wine. Oh geez, we'll we'll focus on one podcast for now and uh, do some spinoffs later. Maybe maybe we'll put Ron on that. Um, so guys, what I'm drinking tonight, uh, you know, this is Labor Day weekend. Hope everybody's had a good Labor Day for everybody listening in. Um, you know, once a big Labor Day tradition is to have family over for a cookout. We had my brother over last night, grilled some steaks. Um, and Alex brought the beer, and he brought one of my favorites, one of the best uh, bourbon barrel aged stouts you're going to find around. Good old dragon's milk. Well, it's freaking delicious, man. Alex, props. <laughs> Excellent taste of beer, man. How did he milk the dragon to get you that beer? You know, it's just better not to ask some questions if you don't need to know the answer fair. to it. Yeah, fair. <laughs> you should know that better than most. <laughs> also true. <laughs> All right, so leading things off, uh, on a on a somber note, we'll start tonight. Uh, Pat Corrales died um, over the weekend. He was 82 years old. He was a former catcher, manager, coach, front office staffer. Uh, dude was a baseball lifer and pretty much did it all. He managed the Rangers, uh, Cleveland, who were the Indians back then, the Guardians. Now, obviously, and he also managed the Phillies briefly. And also, he was a longtime bench coach, under, uh, notably under Bobby Cox, but he also had a gig with the Nationals, and I think he was also a coach with the Rangers as well. Um, worked various front office jobs with the Dodgers from 2012 until his death. He was MLB's first manager of Mexican-American descent back in 1978. He took over for the Rangers for all of one game. It still counts. Um, he did keep the job for the ne- for the next uh, two or three years, though, after that. Um, the Phillies, This I, I found this very odd. They fired him in 1983, even though the team was tied for first place at the time. Um, GM Paul Owens moved down to the dugout and guided the Phillies to the World Series, where they were beaten by the Orioles in five games. Uh, as we remember, the 80s Orioles were a damn good team, so no shame in losing to any of those teams. 
Um, as a manager, uh, mixed results, but he had good seasons in there. 160 and 164 record in Texas, 132 and 115 with the Phillies, and 280 and 355 with Cleveland. Um, he's really well known for his time with Bobby Cox's staff. He joined Atlanta in 1990, was with him through 2006. Um, he was with them during the 14 straight titles and with the world championship in 95, obviously. Um, Snicker, when asked about it, said, quote, I know he and Bobby were so close during that run. He was the guy doing a lot of the heavy lifting. He wasn't afraid to get in somebody's rear end if they needed it. He was a baseball guy through and through. Um, and I really appreciate this quote from Dodgers president and CEO Stan Kasten. Um, he said, I was fortunate to have worked with Pat for more than 30 years at three franchises, also with Atlanta and Washington. He was instrumental in turning all three into championship organizations. He loved mentoring young players, and the number of players he influenced is too long to count. Pat truly loved the game of baseball. We will miss him. I mean, guys, the list of, the list of players this guy was a mentor to is insanely long. Um, some of Atlanta's best catchers from the 90s, because, uh, you know, he focused with catchers a lot because that was his background, Javi Lopez in particular. Um, back when he was still a player, when he was a more veteran player, granted he didn't play for a long period of time, but um, he was um, with the Reds, and uh, one of the guys that he got to mentor with was Johnny Bench. Not a bad guy to know. I, I know Johnny had some nice things to say after he died. So, you know, to Pat, I, really, really awesome guy. I, I have not heard one bad thing from anybody over the, you know, over the last week as tributes have been pouring. And I mean, he was just one of those great guys, lifetime baseball guy. Um, you know, J Jason, did you, rem uh, you, I know you were little and really weren't <laughs> much of a fan, but did, did your family, um, did, you know, did they remember anything from when Pat was the uh, manager of the Phils? Um, well, I was going to ask you, how old do you think I am? Um, because not only was I little, I was not around yet. Um, <laughs> that was that was uh, the year before I was born. Um, okay. But um, no, my parents didn't really say anything about it. Um, I honestly, until I saw that he was a part of him, like I had no idea who he was, honestly. Um, because I, he wasn't known for his time with the Phillies. So, um, but yeah, no, it, 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 he had a very long baseball career overall. Um, yeah, it's definitely a loss for the baseball world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, when I saw that note that the Phillies fired him mid season, despite being tied for first, I was like, what? But that that definitely seems odd, but but you know, as you've mentioned many times, Jason, and as we've seen many times, odd things in the Phillies just kind of go hand in hand sometimes. So I I don't know how I'm supposed to respond to that. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it Is kind it of wrong? it kind of worked out similarly last year, um, but yeah. So um, I mean, and and knowing that. Uh, Seeing that it was Paul Owens, because when I think of that 83 team, the name that I remember is Paul Owens, um, since he was the one that had taken over as manager. Um, it's really interesting because Paul Owens went was GM and then moved to the dugout as manager. So something there, there may have been some disagreements uh, between the two of them or something like that, but... Yeah, I don't Philosophical know. Philosophical disagreements, I believe, is the term you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So anyway, uh, rest in peace to Pat, though. First Mexican-American manager and uh, just great baseball guy. All right, guys. So let's move it on to the playoff update. So um, th there were a lot of big series last week. Just a quick rundown. The Astros swept the Red Sox last week in the road. Uh, Cubs took two out of three from the Brewers at home. The Giants took two out of three from the Reds at home. And then the Dodgers swept the Diamondbacks then for the weekend series. Atlanta took three out of four from the Dodgers in L.A. Uh, the Giants just – melted down against the Padres. They, they had a chance to put the Padres away for good, but dropped three of four on the road. So the Padres are, even though I don't really think they have much of a chance, they're right back in it again. Um, the Cubs and the Reds split a four-gamer in Cincinnati. 
the Phillies laid an egg against the Brewers as uh, Joe is going to bash Jason for later. And then the Orioles took care of business in Arizona, taking two out of three. Gotta take care of your own business first, Cubbies. (laughs) Oh, this is going to be fun. Anyway, so the season ended today in the NL, your one seeds Atlanta, two seeds at is LA three seed is Milwaukee right now. The wild card are Phillies Cubs diamondbacks. So it would be the Phillies Cubs winner would advance to face Atlanta. The diamondbacks Brewers winner would advance to face the Dodgers Um, in the American league. You're looking Orioles, Mariners, twins for the top three wild cards are Rays, Rangers, Astros. Although that's um, there's a lot still going on in both of these hunts. Rays Rangers winner would advance face the Orioles. Uh, Twins Astros winner would advance face the Mariners. Just quickly, can, can I mention that I still think that MLB needs to go and do what every other league does and reseed between the first and second rounds? I, not that I care about facing either Philly or Chicago in the second round, but the fact that the, you know, and we talked about this last year, the one seed should get the lowest remaining seed. Like, or what's mm-hmm. the point of seeding? It, yeah. It's just dumb. It, so, so what if they have to face a division winner if it's a, if it's three six either they face a division winner or you just reseed which is what makes the most sense anyway yeah I mean I don't I don't think the NHL does that anymore um, I do believe it's primary I don't even know if the NBA does that anymore um, I, I, I don't think know it's about the NBA but NFL does I, I say it's primarily yeah. the NFL that recedes yeah. Which, which it makes sense. Anyway, so that ran aside. So the teams the, are still... The, Sorry, the Jason, thing, uh, No, you're fine. The, the thing that, that's going to be really fascinating is um, this podcast, assuming that this holds as it is, um, <laughs> even, even if, one, even if, even if uh, uh, four and five flop with the Phillies and the Cubs, this podcast for two weeks... <laughs> is going to be something else because you're going to have me and Joe and then the winner with you, Andrew, like I can't wait. <laughs> that's like, if there would ever be a time to really tune in to this show would be <laughs> for those two weeks. It's going like, to be a good time. It's going to be a good time. Yeah. Well, but let's for get like there one, for like one person out of the three. <laughs> Hi, that's me. <laughs> At least for the first week. <laughs> <I'll>... <laughs> All right. So it, here's the thing, though. Uh, the NL wild card, dude, this is a mess right now. The Red Coming into games today, I, I haven't updated the standings since some games have played. The Reds came in tied with Arizona, um, but lost because of a tiebreaker. Marlins half game back. Giants one game back. Padres six games back because, of course, the Giants – laid a goose egg against the Padres and put them right back in, even though they should be dead in the water and done. In the American League, the Blue Jays are still a game and a half back. They're still lurking. They could strike. Red Sox, five, it's still a possibility. Um, you know, Jason, you you missed the first of the previews last week. Um, me and Joe were we were really kind of thinking the guys that are like five, the teams are five, six games back. It's doable, but it's a big climb. And it's a big ask now that we're in September. That yeah. said, do you think the Padres might have caught enough fire in a bottle to get going and maybe at least make it interesting? I, I don't think they're going to get that third spot. I don't think they're going to get that high. If tonight is any indication, then no. Um, <laughs> the Phillies are currently up nine to four on them. Um, uh, they, the, I spe- Rich Hill for the Padres was pitching. No, 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 for the Phillies. Taiwan Walker. Oh, then it's definitely possible that this game could flip around. <laughs> oh, a- absolutely. Um, he gave up three runs in, in the fourth inning. Um, I've, I'm not sure what inning they're in currently because I have our um, agenda up. But, um, yeah, I knowing who's in their division, I don't see the Padres making a run for it because if they have divisional games yet, divisional series yet against the Dodgers – the Diamondbacks and e- even the Giants, I, I don't see the Padres catching lightning in a bottle this year. Um, I, th- we need to remember that we're in September. There's now 
25 ish games left in the regular season. Um, can it be done? Sure. But you're talking with that change. You technically only then have like 19 games left to make, make up that difference. It's been done, but the likelihood of it, I don't see it happening. I mean, they're not technically mathematically eliminated from the division, although their elimination number is down to six. So that's not going to happen. That, yeah, that's not that's not going to be feasible. If they're getting in the playoffs, it's going to be an, as a wild card. Yeah, I, their wild I, card I, elimination number is eighteen. So they've they're not they're not imminently in the, you know going to be knocked out. At this point, the thing that they don't have going for them is the teams that are in the wild card race are not playing each other for the most part. Um, Because, I mean, aside from the uh, Cubs and the Reds, like the other teams aren't really in the same division. Um, They did just the Padres did just get the Giants. The Phillies do get the Marlins a little for a series or two, but. It's not like the Phillies and the Cubs are going to be playing each other to to knock each other down, and the Phillies are aren't playing the Reds to knock each other down. Like, yeah, uh, their time is absolutely running out. Yes, um, Joe, pretty much mirrors what we said last week. You think? P- pretty much. I mean, we we kind of thought last week that um, you know before before some teams failed to put some teams away last week, we thought that the NL teams are pretty much set it's just a matter of final positioning yeah so we'll see um yeah we're definitely gonna have to keep an eye on the reds marlins and giants though because it it is definitely still possible but again remember now that we have the tiebreaker system and not uh game 163 or 163 164 like we were really hoping for a couple years ago in the uh, hashtag ultimate chaos scenario, um, you know, now that's tiebreakers, it's kind of easier to see how these races are going to go down because if I'm not mistaken, I believe Arizona holds the tiebreaker over just about everybody below them. So, you know, they're the team to catch right now. They're the team that everybody below them is hoping falls flat in their face, which I don't frankly see happening. Um, magic numbers. I only popped up for the Braves and the Dodgers because they're the only two teams right at this point that are close to having magic numbers we can count. Atlanta's f- magic number for a postseason berth is at five, and both Atlanta and LA, their uh, magic numbers for clinching their divisions are both at 12 at this point. Um, I would expect Atlanta's postseason berth will probably be clinched sometime at the end of this week or early next week. Um, the division, obviously, it's probably not going to be for another week and a half for both teams. Um, some key series this week. In the first half, you've got Astros Rangers. This this might be the biggest series Texas has seen as a state in years. Because I can't remember the last time both the Rangers and the Astros were fighting together, trying to get into the playoffs or, you know, because uh, they never met as World Series teams, I don't believe for back when Houston was in the National League. And I think since they've moved, this is this is the biggest moment they've ever had. So live it up, Texas. This is a uh, this week this first half of the week is all you guys because that this is going to have huge ramifications not only on the AL West race, but also on that wild card race and positioning. The Mariners are absolutely frothing at the mouth right now, just hoping that those teams beat each other up. Yeah, I, they need them to. They need them to because the Mariners are not in a position that they're going to say, hey, we're going to run away with this bye. As hot as they have been, which is ridiculously hot lately, they are still in a deadlock tie with Houston for the AL West title right now and are only ahead by one one thousandth of a percentage point. So I, I feel like if I'm a Mariners fan, I, I would not be upset with a Rangers series win or sweep. Um, well, because... Be sweep. The, the the Astros um, are definitely the bigger threat to the Mariners. Yeah, but the Rangers have better pitching. They have, I think, the Rangers match up better against the Mariners than the Astros do. The, the Rangers have a much deeper pitching staff, even without Jacob Degrom. And I like the Rangers bats more than I like the Astros bats personally. I, I feel like uh, Mariners fans, it, it's it probably felt weird this past weekend actually rooting for the Yankees. 
<laughs> Dude, it always feels weird when you have to root for the Yankees. Makes you feel a little dirty inside, honestly. Um, other first half series to watch out for, obviously, Phillies at Padres is going on right now. Giants at the Cubs, Red Sox at Rays, Mariners at Rays. Uh, why is that on there? Whoops. Anyway, sorry about that. And then second half series to watch, uh, Dodgers, Marlins, Mariners, Rays. That, yeah, I don't know why I had that in the first and the second half. My bad, guys. D-backs. It's that uh, important. Well, no, that's a massive series. It really does deserve <laughs> extra mention. Um, D backs at Cubs, Orioles at Red Sox, and Padres at Astros. Like, so I, the Orioles. That's a need big to week for the Cubs. Yeah. Big week for the Cubs. No pressure, Joe. Um, hey, they, they got one today. Yeah. I mean, the Red Sox will either be looking real pretty after this week or they're going to be done because the Rays and the Orioles put a beat down on both of them. I uh, personally, I, I, you know, if I, if I'm a betting man, I'm saying the Red Sox are probably almost out of the race by the end of this week. Cause I don't, they might take one of these two series. They're not taking both. I don't see that. The, the Rays and the cut and the Orioles are fighting for this division. Neither team can let up. So uh, I have a feeling that the Red Sox are going to be the ones just being at the at the front of the lines just taking that beating yeah i i i'm i'm not seeing the red sox fight back in what do you think joe no i i, I like it similar to what we said with the nl i think the al is pretty much the same thing it's we, we know who's going to be there it's just a matter of where they're going to be yeah at this point i mean you know the, the red sox I mean, five games is a lot. You'd have to have a ton of teams pull a, you know, a, a, a Mets debacle in September. You were the Red Sox. You know, which I don't think is going to happen. You're not going to no. have a ton of teams all do the same thing. No, um, you know, so, so the Padres and the, and the Red Sox are pretty much out of it. Um, the rest of it is, you know, we'll see if, if, if enough mistakes happen above them, then they'll get in, but. It know. it does feel unlikely, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, well, you never know. I mean, I, the, the lineups I've seen more on this later, but the lineups I've seen the last week or so, um, yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, I, it's, I wish I could have. I wish I could have five Justin Steels and have a pitch every day. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want that? That would be amazing. That 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 kid can pitch. Or, you know, or have a, a guy you signed to a four-year deal perform to his contract, but we'll we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, so that's uh, that's our updated look at what the playoffs would look like if they started today, um, dude. It's going to be a fun September. This is going to be a wild ride, and I'm not going to lie. I am really happy we are so far out and ahead, so I can just sit back and watch the chaos happen underneath. And just enjoy it, not feel the constant up and down roller coaster, wild mouse ride of we won, we lost, we won, we lost, we won, we lost. Ah, what the hell happened? You know, so it's <laughs> this is going to be a great September, guys. It, it September is always great in baseball, but it's going to I just have a feeling this year is going to be really great. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's move it on. Um, I'll quick hit the Atlanta last week. It was a great week. They took uh, six out of seven. They swept the Rockies. You've got a 14-4 to four win, 3-1 to one win, and a 7-3 to three win. And then they took three out of four from the Dodgers, and they were on the road all last week. It is the – I should be the last West Coast – yeah, that was the last West Coast trip of the year for Atlanta. Thank God. I hate West Coast trips, although this one went well. Um, the Dodgers scores were 8-7 to seven victory, a 6-3 to three victory, a 4-2 to two and 10 victory, and then a 3-1 to one loss yesterday. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the Dodgers were getting a little salty. Uh, Max Muncy in particular, I shared this with the uh, group chat. Matt, Max Muncy basically said um, – just wait, just wait till October. This doesn't matter. We can, we, we can take them on and beat them in October. Uh, buddy, I understand October is different than September. I, I completely understand that. I got, I, I got two things I want to point out. Number one, we just bloodied your nose in Los Angeles where you traditionally have done very well against us. We haven't won a series in LA since 2012. It's been a while. Number two, the last time there was a playoff series between Atlanta and Los Angeles 
Uh, I, if I remember right, guys, didn't Atlanta win that and then go on to the World Series and win the World Series and they won it in Los Angeles? Yeah, I remember that too. So, uh, yeah, Max, we'll see about that. Um, fun note, Ronald Acuna Jr. joined the became the first inaugural member of the 3060 Club, which is just freaking insane. Um, he also had a Grand Slam the day he got married when he, out in Colorado, which was really cool to see as well. Um, one other pretty cool note from that series, um, one of the, they called up Darius Vines, one of their uh, top five prospects. I can't remember where he's ranked exactly, but um, he made his first ever start out in the Rocky mountain high of Colorado, which as we know is a horrible place to pitch in and pitch very well, six innings, four hits, two earned runs, a walk, five strikeouts. Uh, I think I read a note after the game. He is the first ever rookie pitcher to make their first start in Coors field and only give up two runs. So that was pretty cool to watch. Um, and then, uh, one one other cool thing after uh, Macuna joined the thirty sixty club, Freddie presented him with a signed uh, base commemorating the event the next day. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, also, all the videos from cameramen in the outfield shooting Freddie's expressions when Acuna hit those home runs and just <laughs> absolutely great. So yeah, it was a great week for Atlanta. I've got absolutely no complaints. I you know I kind of wish it would have been a complete perfect week, but I'm very happy with what we had. All right, so let's move on to the fantasy update, week 21. Uh, Ron, I am extremely sorry. It was a 21 to 4 beatdown, although the score did swing around quite a bit last week. We had some categories that were close, but my offense uh just as it's been doing as it's been doing all season, held my team together. And my pitching finally didn't completely suck all week like it has so many weeks, particularly when playing Jason for some reason. And then Jason finally had a good win against Joe at 18 to nine. Um, I For was... my second straight win against Joe, FYI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Been a, been a while. Um, easily the best win I think that I've had against you, Joe. I mean, considering it's only been like my third one, but maybe fourth. <laughs> this might be the first win you've actually been on the show for. <laughs> Actually, I think well, then if you great. want, I'll take a little bit more extra time to talk about it, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours. Go ahead. I, I was I, I was giving you giving you a break, um, apparently, but no, like it was awesome. The show is mine. <laughs> Welcome to the Dollar Dogs and Jason show. Um, but no, Joe, uh, it was a week where I think I led pretty much from the beginning on. Um, the offense, you did come back and end up taking batting average. Um, so the offensive stuff was pretty close. And actually, the pitching uh, for your team did um, come alive late. And then they just kind of, you took a bad loss, I think, yesterday that caused a couple more to go my way. But yeah, I am very pleased with that. Trying to go wire to wire again for this next for this next week. Um, as much as I'd like to say I'm going to come down and beat you out of stopping that wire to wire run. I, I, I think I've run out of time. I got the big win I needed. I did pick up wins on you, but it's still eight and a half games for one week when we're not facing each other is very difficult. Yeah. And as when you're playing Ron, I, I mean, <laughs> well, and the thing with that too, was if there was ever a week for me to, for my team to really show up against Joe, it was this week yeah. because going from 12 and a half down to eight and a half, is not much of a drop in the grand scheme of things. So, right. Yep. So that's, yeah. Looking at the standings, you're, you're at 308 wins. I'm at 300. I'm eight and a half back. Joe, you're at 265, 43 and a half back. And Ron is at 112. Jason, I think you're going to hit the 115. You might even hit the, uh, you might even hit the 120 benchmark. <laughs> Ron just popped on. You're welcome, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it, I needed that last week because if I didn't have a big win, then we would have nothing to talk about except, Hey, the playoffs are in two weeks because everything would be completely set. But at least there's a slight amount of uncertainty, even if I, even if I'm sure that I really don't have a chance of catching that uncertainty. So it, it it's been, it's been fun though this year. Um, we'll make sure we get Ron on, uh, once playoffs are done. Actually, I, I want to bring a lot of people on towards the end of the season anyway, so we can have kind of a round table at the end, but I know, uh, 
I want to get Ron's thoughts, but I, I had a blast with fantasy baseball this year, and I can't wait to do it again with you guys next year. Yeah, it was definitely a good year. It's it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> I am still taking bribes to help uh, <laughs> the results for this week. So, what that yeah. bottle of Jameson's hasn't showed up yet? It has not. Hmm. Need to do something about that. So. All right, so let's look at the... Ron, I'll give you a couple of tickets to my uh, season plan next year if you bench your guys this week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I might need to lock rosters for all of our sanity. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, looking at the regular season award chases, uh, we'll, we'll do the NL side first, then we'll do the AL, because as we all know, the NL is the superior league. So, uh, looking first at the MVP awards, uh, your top three for NL MVP, Ronald Acuna Jr., Mookie Betts, and Freddie Freeman. For the longest time, this was Acuna's to lose, and then Mookie caught fire in August more than any player other than maybe Trey Turner. Um Mookie came out of nowhere and is I, pretty close to even odds with Acuna. I don't know, especially after, um, especially after this past weekend where Mookie did next to nothing against Atlanta and Acuna was blasting home runs. I don't think you're going to see Mookie catch Ronald at this point. Freddie might. Freddie's got a much deeper um, resume set up. The dude also is hitting the crap out of the ball and it continues to hit for high average. But I, my personal feeling, guys, is that it's still Acuna's award to lose. Um, and I think despite Mookie's chase, I, I actually think Freddie is more likely to be the number two than Mookie is. Um, I know some places still have Matt Olson listed, and I think in any other year, given the fact that he's tied for the lead in MLB in home runs and will lead the NL in RBIs, um, I think he would be a viable option, but that's not going to happen with how Acuna's played this year and how Freddie and Mookie are playing in L.A. Uh, Joe, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I guess as, as a homerish pick, I would say I think you got to consider Bellinger for this too a little bit. Uh, I mean, the guy has had 59 RBIs since the break, so he's been ask, he's been a huge boost to the Cubs and, as Jason likes to say, most valuable to their team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I, I, that I 100% agree with. Bellinger he is, he is by huge. far the most valuable player on that team for Chicago. And I'm going to go once again on the record and say they need to get moving and get him re-signed. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not buying – they didn't make an, an, an uh, extend T-shirt this year for him, and I'm not buying another one of those because we saw how that went. Um, <laughs> but the guy has, has proved his worth, you know, astronomically this year and he's been a huge reason that offensively they've been able to stay in it um jason what are your thoughts on the nl mvp race um it's going to be acuna i i think again uh, on a team that has been so good this year um a tremendous offense from top to bottom acuna is standing out and you mentioned uh mookie and freddie um we're going to see a split vote happen with those two, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that not that Acuna needs the split vote to happen, but I think that's going to boost his chances at uh, winning, which I, I mean, it's uh, thinking back to Joe, what you said, you know, it's the most valuable player to their team. I think Acuna is the most valuable player to his team. But Matt Olson is making people think a lot about it. Oh yeah. Um, so uh, I, I still think it's going to be Acuna. But yeah, I don't think Olson has enough to cause a split vote with him and Ronald because all he has, he's got the homers, he's got the RBIs. He had that horrible cold streak though, um, pretty much throughout throughout the entire month of May and into the first week, week and a half of June. I, I mean, it, it, it was, it was that bad that I dropped him in, yeah. in fantasy because like he, it, it was abysmal, like beyond abysmal. Thanks for that, by the way, because uh, yeah. my first baseman are Freddie and Olsen now, and it is great. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Um, one note before we hop on to the Cy Young. Uh, my barber hopped on, Johnny. He said, hi from the Baron Barber's Whiskey Blade Cruise. Love you guys. Thanks for the support, Andrew. Keep the great content going. I'm a Yankees fan, so not a lot to add this year. I remember when I went in for my haircut last time, Johnny was like, we are not talking about the Yankees because that was right after the Braves swept them. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you don't want to talk about the fact that the Yankees couldn't score a run in a wet paper bag? <laughs> And as he pointed out, it's maybe not the best idea to do that Well, a guy's got a razor blade to your neck shaving you. And it, I, I was going to say, I, I am very impressed that he didn't Sweeney Todd you or something like that. <laughs> yeah, right. You got the, no, oh, just, wait, what, is that a chunk of hair missing from over there? Yeah. <laughs> no, Whoops. Johnny is an a- absolute consummate professional. Great guy and uh, always a great guy to talk baseball. Um when Chad's around, uh, Chad's a Red Sox fan, so it's fun to get the two of them going back and forth because uh, usually it's close to one of those series, so that's always fun as well. Yeah, thanks for the support, Johnny. Yeah, we really appreciate it, bud. All right, now for one of the most wide-open races there is, the NL Cy Young Award, because nobody's really pulling away. Um, I, I think the I think the, the favorite right now has to be Zach Galen of Arizona, but I uh, there's a lot of guys that are still very much in the mix. Logan Webb's in the mix, Zach Wheeler, Blake Snell, Justin Steele, even Spencer Strider. Although I, of those guys, I think Strider is the least likely of that list, but that's how tight the um, NL Cy Young race is right now. It's, it's not that tight. I do. It, it's going to be Blake Snell. It's Blake Snell's to lose. Really? It is, it not, is absolutely, not feeling. No. Uh, Blake Snell has, been a beast uh this entire season he he has the lowest dra um he's racking up wins he's pitching out of his mind right now um i i i would absolutely say that right now it's blake snell's to lose okay yeah number two in strike okay yeah i, I know and, nobody's gonna catch strider but okay, yeah, okay. And, and, yeah, one's only at 186 okay his strikeout pace has slowed down all right that's, yeah, that's and, a fair point. And, and, and tell you what, um, I'll even pull up. I just pulled up some betting odds for you. Um, mm-hmm. Zach Allen's not even in your top uh, three. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so okay. In, in third at plus 550 is Spencer. Uh, second plus 350 is Justin Steele. And your leader at minus 260 is Blake Snell. Okay. All right. I'd buy that. Um, okay. So if we're going to look at that as the top three, um yeah, Snell or Steel, I think ahead of Strider. Although I know Strider leads leads the NL and wins. He leads strikeouts. Um he went cold for a good month or that's, so. That's exactly why I can't put him ahead of Steel. Steel has been consistently better this season. Yeah. I, I would not be surprised to see see uh Steel come back and take it. Um, because he has probably what three ish starts yet. Maybe four. Um, yeah. Everybody so, has three to four starts left, I would think. Yeah. So, uh, again, uh, we're kind of getting to the point we were talking about the playoff races. We're, we're getting to the point where we're starting to run out of time for players to uh, catch the the odds on favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I I would not be surprised to see Steele if he continues at his pace, uh, potentially to overtake it, um, especially if Snell gets roughed up over the next start or two. Um, but, but currently it, it's absolutely, uh, Snell's to lose. Or one thing to consider too, if he doesn't get run support, yeah. I know wins don't matter as much, you know, cause we saw Jacob deGrom win it with what, 10, 11 wins one year because he was so dominant. But when you have other guys that have a lot more wins and do have comparable stats, because Justin Steele's ERA is not that far behind Blake Snell. You're looking at 250 versus 269. That's not a, that is not a huge difference right there. So, you know that that win total could end up being a kicker because Steele is number two in the NL with 15 wins right now behind uh, Strider 16. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, well, after today, he's got 16 wins. Nice. First nice. off, uh, his ERA is 2.55 now, so it's not even significantly far off from Blake Snell. Yeah, my list hasn't updated with games. It doesn't update until games, all games complete, so that makes sense. Yeah, that's all right. Um, a whip of 1.14. Um, he has 19 quality starts, I believe. 
Um, they're 19 and seven when he's on the mound and nine straight wins in a row. I know wins obviously are not, not as huge of a factor, but, um, the guy has been a bulldog, man. It's been amazing to watch eight, eight innings today, 107 pitches should have gone out there to finish it, but whatever, <laughs> um, you know, he, the guy has been fantastic every fifth day wanting the ball. Yeah, that's his 19th quality start. Yep. 19 quality starts, 19 wins when he's on the mound in some way, shape, or form. All right. I'm going to go steal. I'm going to go steal. I think the fact that the Padres are slowly inching their way out of the playoffs, I think that's going to impact it too. Yeah. Because you're going to see – you're going to see more steel. One of the Diamondback games this weekend got flexed to the night game, you know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, he's pitching Saturday, I think, but still, um, you know, there's more exposure, more talk about him. At the yeah. moment, I fully expect the Padres to win tonight because the Phil- the Phillies bullpen is absolutely, basically back to like the 2018 bullpen right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it it is currently nine five. Uh, in the seventh with no outs and runners on second and third. So I, I fully expect the Phillies to, to lose this game because it's absolutely the Phillies thing to do, but you're not wrong. You're not wrong about that. All right. So let's uh, look at NL rookie of the year. I prohibitive favorites. uh, Corbin Carroll has to be Um, Jason. You had the list of the other guys that were being considered though. Not probably not very likely. Yeah. Um, so for the National League, you have Corbin Carroll, who is the who is minus seven thousand. Um, that's <laughs> ba- basically it's just basically over. That's a lot. Um, uh, second, you have Kodai Senga, followed by Spencer Steer, James Altman, and Matt McLean. Um, Senga's at plus seventeen hundred. So there's a big gap yeah. there. That's not going to happen. All right, so we'll uh, skip the discussion on the NL Rookie of the Year if it's starting to run away that badly. (laughs) Um, All right, let's move over to the American League MVP. I think Shohei's going to run away with it. Um, it, What doesn't the guy do at at the bat? I mean, he's leading the American League in home runs right now. um, By Oh, my God, it's up to nine. Luis Roberts only has 35. Jeez, that's nuts. He's third in the uh, third in the American League in RBIs right now. I he is fifth in hits. Guys, I I, I don't want to make it a one man race, but I'm not really seeing anybody else in the American League who is jumping out at me. A lot of your prohibitive MVP favorites spent a lot of the year on the IL. Trout's been on the IL most of the year. Um, Aaron Judge was on the IL for a large chunk, although. Ironically, he's still hitting home runs at roughly the same pace he was last year, approximately every 9.3 at-bats he's hitting a home run. But when you lose that month, month and a half, kind of dashes your MVP hopes. Um, I is, is there anyone even remotely close? The only reason I'm asking is because now that he's not pitching. Maybe Yandy no. no. Diaz. There, there. It's so far gone that it's not even listed as like betting options currently. <laughs> like, I figured, but I just, yeah, yeah. All right, so that's the AL MVP. We don't need to break into that any farther. Let's let's wait into what what could hopefully be at least somewhat more of a discussion. AL Cy Young. So, um, some guys I've been looking at: Garrett Cole, Sonny Gray, Nathan Eovaldi, George Kirby, Shohei. Although I think we could take Shohei off the list now that he's done pitching for the year. Um, Felix Batista, Framber Valdez. Um, I, I think Jason may finally, for the first time ever, and guessing Garrett Cole might finally get his pick correct. Third time's a charm, baby. It's not guaranteed. I mean, he and Sonny Gray are neck and neck in the ERA race right now. Um, he is third in the strikeouts. Gossman is leading that pretty heavily coming in right now, 207 to 196, 188 for Cole. Um, Cole does lead the American League, though, with 20 quality starts. Um, I I I feel like it, Cole's probably going to take it at this point, but I don't think it's locked up as much as, uh, say, the NL Rookie of the Year race or the AL MVP race is at this point. 
Um, but I think at this point, I think he's got a sizable enough lead that he should probably be okay the rest of the way out. Plus, given that the Yankees are done, it's not like they're going to have to pull him to rest him for starts for the playoffs. So we'll get to see him the whole way. Yeah. What do you think, Joe? Yeah, I mean, probably. Uh, it's probably his to lose. I don't know what the numbers are. Jason's more the betting odds guy. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, you, you can't discount what Sonny Gray has been able to do this year. Yeah, um, Sonny's been really good. I, I think he's been excellent for them, uh, for the Twins. Uh, you know, if if Seattle goes on on a run here between now and the end of the year, Kirby could enter the conversation again. But I, it's probably between Cole and Gray at this point. Because they're not going to give it to a, a reliever, and Bautista's been on the IL. So, yeah, I that that was as, as good as as good as Bautista has been. He's not getting it. Yeah, hey, Luis Castillo should be considered as well. Um, you know, you know what the thing that really strikes me about George Kirby, though, the fact that the dude barely walks anybody. C- can we just appreciate for a second how good he is at not walking batters? almost Greg Maddox-esque in his accuracy. You just, you don't see that anymore. And it's really cool. He has 14 walks this year, guys. He has made uh, 26 starts. He is (laughs) 26 starts and 14 walks. I freaking love it. But that said, I don't think he, I think um, Luis Castillo is, of the two, is more likely to get, uh, the Cy Young look for the American League. Um, what do you think, Jason? Um, yeah, it, Garrett Cole, I think. Uh, I'm going to stick by him. I've been trying to get him to win the Cy Young for a few years now, so I'm going to stick with him as my pick. Um, looking at some up some recent uh, betting odds here, um, we're looking at Garrett Cole at minus 250, followed by Luis Castillo at plus 410, Sonny Gray at plus 1,200, and then Gossman at plus 1,200 as well. So, um, yeah, it's pretty well in uh, Garrett Cole's favor currently. Okay. And then looking at the AL Rookie of the Year, um, Gunnar Hendrickson, I think, is going to be the runaway favorite for this. Jason, should we even mention the other guys, or is this pretty much a runaway as well? It's pretty much a runaway uh, for uh, Gunnar Henderson. Um of the Baltimore Orioles. Um, he is at minus 800 to win the AL rookie of the year. Tristan Casas is at plus 1000 and then Tanner Bibby is at plus 1900. So yeah. it, it's, it's again, pretty much over. We could stick a fork in that one. All right. So that's where we are at with the, uh, with the regular season award races at this point, it's going to be fun to watch. I, I, I like watching that as well. Um, Wait, NL Cy Young, that's going to be a lot of fun to watch to see which way they end up going between um, between Snell and Strider and Steele. Um, that's good. Hey, they're all S's too. That's great. Triple S. <laughs> all right. Uh, Jason, how about them Phillies before Joe rips you a new one for completely dropping the ball this past weekend against Milwaukee? Well, we'll we'll ignore what's going on tonight because they were up eight to one at one point and it's currently uh nine to seven. So um yeah, it's gonna be just flat out garbage. I fully expect them to lose this game tonight. Um it would be what they do. Um especially September, time for a collapse, the usual. Last year was a fluke. Um but anyway, uh on to last week for the Phillies. They ended up going three and three, so it's kind of a midweek. Um they did play the Angels at home first. They took uh, that series two games to one. They won game one, six to four. Game two, 12 to seven. And game three, they did lose that one, 10 to eight. Uh, kind of spoiling um, some history there because in that game, Bryce Harper hit his 300th home run uh, of his career. And it's actually really interesting because I know I've told you guys before that pretty much every game that I've had with my season ticket plan, something has happened, um, whether it be uh, good for the Phillies or bad for the Phillies. Like um, our first game was the Luis Arias cycle, the first in Marlins history. Um, well, 
I had tick my tickets were actually for Wednesday when Harper hit his 300th home run. So uh, Craig, a guy, a buddy of mine at work, ended up buying those tickets, so he was able to be there in person. Um, Harper's home run did give them the lead, which the bullpen then promptly gave back, uh, thanks to the help of Garrett Stubbs not knowing how to block a ball in the dirt um, on the strike three call, uh, which let the tying run go to first. Anyway, uh, they then went on the road to face the Brewers, and sorry, Joe, the Phillies did drop two out of three. Uh, they did come back and salvage game three. Uh, game one was 7-5 loss, as well as game two, 7-5. Um, I have a feeling Joe's going to rant about this a little bit, but in game two, uh, Phillies are up 5-3 uh, at one point, then was 5-4. And with two outs, bases loaded. Alec Bohm, who has been so good this year, uh, had something happen where he just missed the ball on a backhand. Three-run error to give the Brewers the lead and the win eventually. They did salvage game three with a 4-2 to two win. Um, two notes here. Um, Trey Turner hit a home run in five straight games. Uh, this past week, which ties a Phillies record, I believe. Uh, that streak did end on Sunday. And the Phillies in August had 59 home runs. Uh, franchise record in home runs for a month. And it ended up being, I believe, the third highest home run total in a month um, in MLB history. Uh, I believe the Yankees are at, are at number one. And the 2021 Braves, are, I believe, were second. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, not an awful week, but definitely a week that a couple games got away from the fills. Um, yeah, actually that, that Alec Bomer, I believe was actually in game one instead, not, not game two, um, because it was back to back, back to back games that the Phillies, um, superstars gave them a lead with home runs, um, and just didn't get it done. Yeah, so Alec Bohm, that is his ninth error of the year. Um, only his fourth at third base. He had five at first base because, remember, he played a bunch at first base earlier this year. Um, but he is that's, on pace. Yeah. yeah, that's not terrible, though, like considering no. where he was last year. like uh, That's about average, really. Yeah. It, he, here's the thing that gives me pause, though, Jason. He is on pace to set a career worst in D-War this year. He's He is right now at negative 1.7, which is the lowest he's ever been. I mean, I, I, I know he's been overall better, but the dude just uh, – can, can I – one one thing that drives me nuts, and i i had to, I had to listen to my coworker Chuck rant about this because uh, on Sunday when I when we got to work, why are we getting away from the basic fundamentals of get the hell in front of the ball? Why why does everybody try for the flashy backhand move when it's not necessary? I understand sometimes you don't have a choice; you have to make a backhand. You have to make a backhanded catch and throw. So you know, depending on where the ball is at. But when you don't have to. Get the hell in front of the ball. Let it hit you in the chest. Knock it down. So you, I just, why are we losing fundamentals? Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I wasn't watching that game live. Um, I saw the replay and it was a fairly hard hit ball, but I still don't think that there was any reason for him to not get in front of that. Um, the only thing I could think of was, I think a lot of times they backhand so that they're able to load up on their back foot a while and for the throw across to first. But yeah, ah, it it, it was definitely still pre really really terrible. Um, I do have to say that I I give some props to Trey Turner here for being a leader and being a good teammate here. He he went over to him after that and said, Hey, don't worry. You'll make that play to win us the world series later and later this year. So, I mean, grand, there's a lot that has to happen for that to even like for them to even get that far. But, uh, and I'm not saying that they're going to get to world series, but that's what you want to hear from a veteran on your team and, and a star on your team to really pick up a guy. Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, <laughs> Joe, I'm re I'm really sorry, man. I, I know you were really uh, counting on the Phillies to not completely lay an egg this past weekend. Well, I mean, look, 
Jason's right. You got to take care of your own business, and we'll get to that shortly. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I mean, and the thing is, they they were on the road. Um, it just didn't work out. Um, the Phillies should have absolutely taken two out of the three. Um, personally, I'm just glad they avoided the sweep somehow. Um, cause that would have been absolutely abysmal. Uh, this late in the season, you cannot take a sweep. No, absolutely yeah. not. So yeah, that, that it, I think is sweet. I mean, it would have been a dagger in the heart to the Phillies. I, they have enough of a lead that they wouldn't have fallen out of the wild card. I don't think, but still just, they want to host that wild card round. That is right. huge right now. Right. You want to be that top wild card so you have the home games because that's the only way as a wild card team to have the home games. And yeah, that's just one you really cannot afford to lose. Um, I was, I, I'm going to be honest, Jason. I, I was real. I know Milwaukee's hot and the fact that they're actually hitting, which is completely strange to me watching Milwaukee actually hit the baseball. Um, the fact that the Phillies didn't do more than they did, I was really surprised by. I thought the Phillies were going to show better in that series than they did. But well, and and the thing is though, like they're scoring their runs. It's just they're not getting the good pitching. They're not getting uh good plays from their defenders. Um like there is absolutely no reason for Mike Mustakis to get to first base on a drop strike three call. You yeah. get you drop yeah. down to your knees like Monica Lewinsky and you block the ball. <laughs> oh, you actually went there. Why am I not surprised? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, yeah, it's, it's just so, so bad. Um, the bullpen has just been letting things get away. Um, they're trying to get, they're trying to lose one tonight. Um, yeah, I have that sinking feeling that the September collapses of 20, uh, I don't even know if I want to say 2021, but 2021, 2020, 2019, like those years, um, those have, those September collapses under Joe Girardi, it, it feels like that it's happening again. Yeah, I can certainly understand the uh, worry and concern for that. Um, just the one happy note, though, with Bryce Harper hitting home run number 300, he is now the, what is that, the ninth? No, the 12th active player with 300-plus home runs. He joins Miggy, Nelson Cruz, although Nelson's not currently playing with a team. He's on the free agent list, Giancarlo Stanton, Mike Trout, Joey Votto, Evan Longoria, Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, Freddie Freeman, Manny Machado, J.D. Martinez. So uh, seriously, congratulations to Price on joining the th the uh, 300 club. Awesome to see. Yeah, and he, he did it at home, which was great. Uh, yeah. he, had, he had a home run in each game of that series to, to get to 300. Uh, <laughs> so you could tell he wanted to do it at home. And yeah. he... He tried to put the team on his back for that last game with that, but clearly they had other ideas. But yeah, that, that bullpen's got to get fixed. That that will absolutely bite you in the ass. Yeah. All right. So next, I want to talk a little bit about ballpark safety. Uh, we had two major issues that occurred over the past two weeks. First, at Guaranteed Rate Stadium, which is the fuck the White Sox. What? I I hate it. I hate corporate names. Anyway, so you had a shooting which wounded two women during the White Sox A's game, uh, most likely involved a gun that went off inside the stadium. News later came out that one of the women likely had the gun hidden in her abdomen and under some fat rolls. Uh, my first question was, how the hell did that get past metal detectors that have been in place since 2015? That's when MLB said every ballpark has to have metal detectors. Um, Fred Waller, the interim superintendent of the Chicago Police Department, said police initially requested that the game be halted after the shooting was discovered. The White Sox said the day afterwards they weren't even aware at first that a woman was injured during the game. That it was because of a gunshot and that police would have stopped play if officers thought it was unsafe to continue. So, uh, first of all, I mean, that's probably just a lot of this continual White Sox organizational mess that we've been talking about all year um, for that. but. I, I do want to know how the hell did a metal detector not detect that? Because it's not like fat is equal to a lead vest that would cover it and block x-rays. 
So I'm not really buying that or did they not test their equipment or, you know, there's a lot of questions from that that need to be answered. And then at Coors Field last week, seventh inning of the Braves Rockies game, an individual ran onto the field to take a selfie with Acuna, putting his arms physically on him and around Acuna before security personnel dashed over. It was a very late response by the on-field security and then while they worked to pry the individual off Acuna, another individual ran onto the field and rushed towards Acuna and made contact and actually knocked him over. Um, he did get up over his own power, didn't need to be removed from the game. He was completely fine. Uh, thankfully, he wasn't hurt because you, you never want to see any player get hurt over idiot fans running onto the field. Um, Snicker said after the game, you don't want to see that happen. I know that. You don't know what they will do when they get out there. It's a scary situation. Um, Bud Black, the manager of the Rockies, said that's disappointing for me that it happens, especially in our ballpark, in our town. That bothers me. It bothers me in general when I see it elsewhere in all sports. But, you know, I, <sighs> fans are idiots. Fan is short for fanatic, as we well know. It's not like this is the first time we've ever seen fans run out in the field. But that's really bad. Like, usually when fans run out in the field, they don't make it to the players because security intercepts them and puts them face first into the turf. The fact that they were able to get all the way to Acuna before security got there definitely raises uh, who the hell have you hired for security? Um, looking at MLBPA's comments, um, they said they're going to review safety and protocol for all teams and stadiums in light of the events. The uh, statement they released was, quote, following security incidents, including those on field, our director of security is in immediate contact with MLB security and local authorities where appropriate. In addition to our security experts, our PA, our, uh, PA player services staff is in daily contact with the players, providing updates and any relevant information. While the details of the recent incidents in Chicago and Denver are still under investigation, we will be reviewing the club and city and protocols currently in place, as we do throughout every season to mitigate the possibility of, of similar future incidents. Um, Ian Happ um, is one of the members of the eight-player executive subcommittee. Um, he called the Acunians in a scary moment, but um, he did caution against connecting the pair of incidents. I thought this was a very, very intelligent quote from Hap. I think they're very different. I think each probably has to be evaluated on its own, which they do need to be evaluated separately because an accidental gun discharge is not the same as two idiots running onto the field. Um, that said, I, what the hell is up with this, guys? You get a gun into a stadium, and then you have two guys that not only get down to the field, but are able to get all the way over to a player to make physical contact with the player. There is a reason there is supposed to be on the field security that is supposed to be keeping an eye out for stuff like this. Like, I, I, what the hell? Uh, Joe, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know a lot of things, no. but. Yeah, look, I, I mean, the, the mess with the with Acuna, that's, I mean, buying a ticket does not give you a license to be a complete jackass. I've said that a hundred times on this show, <laughs> and it's just more of the same here. I mean, you know, people don't need to understand that buying a ticket does not give you a license to do stupid things. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Yeah, um, it, it's, and it's ridiculous. And let's remember the players, specifically MLB, warns their players if you see if you see fans on the field to get away from them, do not try to engage them, do not try to take them down. You don't know if they're carrying a weapon, you know, because they don't want to. See, you know, baseball players don't go out in pads like football players do. It's not like you know when a linebacker decks an idiot fan running across the field, they've got padding on. They're going to be fine if the fans got a hidden knife. Baseball players don't have that except for the catchers. Yeah, and if the uh, if the metal detectors aren't going to catch this stuff, you know. How does um, it get in? How does that happen? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and the thing is, you know that if, if Acuna would have decked that guy, that fan – he'd be the one getting suspended and things like that, right. even though it's, it should be considered self-defense. Yeah. And that would be absolutely ridiculous if MLB would have, you know, if, if that would have been what happened, if MLB would have suspended Acuna for defending himself, that would just, you, you think Joe's got a rant later. I would have, uh, I, I would have made Rob Manfred go cowering if that would have happened. Um, to, like, and I understand, you know, fans running on the field, that's happened since professional organized sports have happened. It's going to happen again. There is no way to stop it. But 
I, I think one thing that definitely needs to happen, they need to definitely take a closer look at who they are hiring to be the on the field personnel for security, not just the guys walking around the stadium during the game, but you need to have guys on the field that are physically fit enough that they can chase these guys down because it should never happen that somebody should be able to get on the field and make physical contact with any player. There should be a security guy that is close enough to chase them down and take them down before that happens. Yeah, I mean this this the the Acuna incident is is just that man. It's just you know who, who somebody messed this up. Yeah, like, drastically messed this up. Um, I mean, every time you when you watch an NFL game and a guy gets on the field somehow, they're taken down fairly quickly. Um, yeah, the fact that this person, these two people weren't is somebody messed something up. And, and you even see like. Look at between innings. You see an entire security force uh, standing on the track going around the stands. You know, they're clearly not leaving the area. They're going to be sitting in, like, the front row or on a chair at the gate, you know, something like that. How how do you not react quickly? Yeah, I, I don't get it. But let's put it to you this way. The squirrel that got on the field during the Penn State-West Virginia game wasn't on the field as long as those two guys were at the Braves-Rockies game, and that's just wrong. And he even scored a touchdown. Yeah. That's right. He did get all the way to the end. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love the college this, football's back. <laughs> as, far, as far as the White Sox situation, clearly, I mean, if your metal detectors are eight years old, I have some questions. <laughs> yeah, I – I don't um, actually know how old the detectors themselves are. The White Sox are understandably not releasing that information or information when they were calibrated and tested last because uh, uh, clearly, I don't know if it's going to, you know, who knows if it's a systemic issue, if it was just that one particular one, but even still, that shouldn't happen. There was a lot going on on this particular night, I think, in, in Chicago, because I think um, there was a concert that was supposed to be held after the game. Oh jeez! And this happened like this. This shooting happened earlier, and I think they had probably decided it at some point after that to go. Yeah, okay, we're not going to have this concert, but they didn't announce that until the game was damn near over. So you had people spending. <sighs> they didn't want to have a riot. You had you had people spending money for three more innings or four more innings, and they would have stayed to not yeah. have something. And it's just like. Be, be intelligent about this. Like you need to, you know, think about all the different contingencies when something like this happens. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. They should have stopped the game then and there sorted it out and then continued the game after that. I, it, it never should have gotten to the point that it did. And let's be real. I mean, it was white Sox and A's. If you have to just stop the game and cancel the game, Nobody is going to care because it's the White Sox and the A's. Neither team is even within sniffing distance. Of- Pretty sure the A's are already eliminated. I think the A's were eliminated two games into the season. Yeah. Um, but yes, mathematically, they are eliminated as well as morally eliminated, like they have been for the last 160 games. Um, I don't know, man. This is, there's just, there's just so much wrong. That's what gets me. There's so much wrong with both of these incidences and they're widely different security issues. So what, you know, the only, the only thing I can hope for is that we don't see anything else like this for the rest of the season. And um, in the off season, there is a very, very long and hard look at all of these security protocols for all the teams across the league so we don't see anything like this happen again i mean like i said i understand fans are going to get in the field that's going to happen let's just have a quicker response time but i don't ever want to see a case where somebody is able to sneak a gun into a game again that should not ever happen i mean i they're prohibited even if you have a even if you have a concealed carry permit you're not allowed were, to were there any fines or anything announced of the white Sox by mlb no not yet because they should absolutely be severely fined and penalized for that. Yeah. Nope. And if there have been fines, MLB has not publicly issued them at this point. 
And I'm sure that's probably something that will stay probably more hidden in behind closed doors. All right, let's move it along now. Uh, Jason, what do you have for down on the farm this week? Yeah, so uh, we're going to go down on the farm here. We're going to start uh, with the uh, player of the week, uh, Jake McCarthy of the Reno Aces, uh, which is the AAA team for the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, he didn't have any like home runs. It wasn't like a big like power number week for him. Uh, he only had like three RBI. But what I focused on this week, he hit 535 last week. Damn. 535 and only got three RBI out of it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think I saw it was like 16 for 28 or something like that. 17 for 28, something like it was some crazy number. Um, so, yeah, Jake McCarthy of the Reno Aces, uh, batter of the week there. And then the pitcher of the week, I'm it, it, this one is a – it's the first time that I've really had a Phillies player for a while. Um, but uh, Mitch Noonborn, not newborn, Noonborn, um, <laughs> of the Jersey Shore Blue Claws, a uh, fantastic name, the high A affiliate for the Phils. Um, again, not not an overpowering week. He he went one and oh, only had only went five innings in that start. But here's the thing. 10 strikeouts in those five innings. So 10 out of the basically two thirds of his outs were strikeouts. So uh, that's a heck of a heck of a week there. So um, yeah, Mitch Newborn of the Jersey Shore Blue Claws for the pitcher of the week. Jersey Shore Blue Claws. That is a great name for a baseball team. Yeah. It's not the it's not the Rocket City Trash Pandas or the Savannah Bananas, but that's pretty good. Yeah, or the Durham Bulls. <laughs> That'll always be one of my favorites for obvious reasons. All right, Joe, the floor is yours. Ran away, buddy. <laughs> All right, so we'll give you the the short end of this real quick here. The, the Cubs. Um, Take two of three from Milwaukee to begin the week. They lose the first game six to two. This was the Wade Miley revenge game because they made him look like Cy Young. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Uh, the um, they they win a one nothing game. That was Justin Steele's start for the week, um, uh, and at that point had a two point six nine ERA. It is now two five five, um, and then they went three uh, two in the third game. Kyle on the mound. Gives him a solid six innings. Um, doesn't get the win, but still, uh, you know, still a good game for him. So, um, you know, and then uh, the Red Series, this is where most of my consternation is right now um, with the way that this series played out. Uh, but the, the quick and dirty of it, they they split a doubleheader Friday 6-2 um, and 2-3, uh, the games there. They lose on Saturday two to one, and they win on Sunday with a fifteen to seven win, which was probably the bright spot of the weekend. Uh, they scored seven runs in the eighth inning. Um, Madrigal had a two run single. Talkman had a two run single. Belly had a sack fly, and Swanson had a two run double. So um, you know an excellent offensive output just in the eighth inning alone. Uh, they batted around, which was great, um, but. This this red series really should have been either three or four or a clean sweep. Anything less than that is unacceptable. I'm sorry, it just is. The Reds are not that good. They they looked good for periods of time throughout the year, but they're not that good. And the fact that you gave up a couple of games here this week, Thursday night they announced they had promoted uh, Alex Canario and um, Sh Shane Green. Um, up from AAA, uh, Shane Green, a pitcher who's been stretched out to start, um, didn't get the second game start of the, the doubleheader, which is baffling to me. He didn't pitch until he pitched an inning yesterday. Um, and so why did you, why did you call him up? Um, uh, Canario was hitting the cover off the ball in AAA and hasn't played yet. 
since he was called up. I don't understand that. Like, the time is, this is not the time to start Patrick Wisdom anywhere. The fact that you have a hitter who's almost worse batting average wise as, as Kyle Schwarber, it might be close. I forget what it was. We talked about it last week. You have a guy who's that bad batting average wise, but doesn't have the OPS numbers to, to back it up. Um, why is he getting any meaningful innings at this point of the year? You know, he, he's playing at first base, which is not his primary position. You have Cody, you have Cody in center field. You have a excellent hitter in Mike Talkman, who is on the bench for whatever reason, who's been a really good center fielder so that belly could play first base most of the year. Um, you know, and that's been a winning combination for them. I don't understand this. You have you you win the, the first game of the doubleheader, and then you run out a reliever to open the game, and he pitches eleven pitches, goes two thirds of an inning. You pull him, and the conversation at the mound shows a lot of these guys laughing, and I'm just like, you wasted two thirds of an inning, so you could bring Drew Smiley in for three innings, and he pitched well. Don't get me wrong. You pitched well. Hayden pitched really well. But the fact that you wasted a bullpen arm to start this game when you just promoted somebody who stretched out to be a starter. Starting pitching is your problem right now. I don't get it. You have a guy who's hitting the cover off the ball and you got Patrick Wisdom taking meaningful at-bats away from him. What are we doing? This is ridiculous. It just it just feels fundamentally unserious. I know I say that all the time, but it just feels like they're just happy to be there. They're not, you know, they're not, you know, you're you're within a couple of games here and you're not making an effort to catch the Brewers at this point. I mean, I shouldn't have to rely on the Phillies. You're playing the Reds with a bunch of guys hurt. You have McLean hurt. You had Steer was was hitting really well, but pitching wise, they're not that good. Like, what are, what are we doing? If you're not going to play these guys, why the hell did you bring them up? You you know, for the Reds, I understand they're seventy two and sixty eight. They're negative thirty four run differential, and their expected win loss record is sixty seven and seventy three. They've had a lot of lucky breaks go their way. Patrick Wisdom in 83 games this year is slashing 200, 288, 500. That's an OPS of 0.788. He somehow has a positive war at 0.2, although I'm not exactly sure how. The dude has struck out 102 times this season, and he's walked only 28. This guy should not be starting for any team that's got a record over... 350. So that probably leaves like Oakland and a couple others. That that's the only place a guy like this should be starting right now. He should not be in a starting lineup except for like one game spell, like one game per week. If you need to spell one guy, you know, okay, fine. That's the extent of where he should be. But here's the thing: you are a team fighting for a playoff spot and fighting to improve your wild card positioning. You don't need to be resting guys right now. You need to be throwing your best lineup out there day in and day out. You need to take those wins wherever you can get them. Yeah, I mean, this this series should not have been a 2-2 a split. No, that's that's really bad. As a Cub fan, that's just unacceptable. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, Milwaukee, I get it. And those games in June when I was coming back from – my, my trip out there when they were playing them and they had that, they laid that egg that first game of that series. It was just like, now that looks really important right now, doesn't it? Like, this is insane. Never overlook games played in your own division. I have said that before. I will say that again. You can never overlook those division games. They matter more than most people realize because let's remember, after head-to-head, the next tiebreaker is record in the division. And you also get less divisional games starting this year. Yep. Yeah. The, the other thing on the pitching front, not only did they start Jose Quas 
in the, the start of that second game of the doubleheader. But they had um, – he threw Mark Leiter Jr. out there five nights in a row. I'm like, you just promoted a guy. Throw him out there. Like, Why do you throw a guy five games in a row? And and Alzali comes in and clearly doesn't have it in the one out he got in the eighth inning, and you throw him back out there in the ninth, and he blew the fucking game. What, what are you doing? If the guy doesn't have it, pull him. If Jamison Tyone pitches more than three innings every game when he's pitching the way he's pitching, you're an idiot. <laughs> Jamison Tyone's stats this year – He's got a record of seven and nine. He's made 25 starts, 5.73 ERA, only 127 innings, 113 strikeouts, and a whip of 135. It's not going to get it done. 135 as a starter. Yeah. Jesus. This is, it's just, it's unacceptable. The fact that they're, they're he's marching out these people, it, these guys, it's just like, what are we doing? I don't care about rhythm. I don't care about off days. It's September. Yeah. You fought your way off in. Days so don't that matter. You, you fought your way in so that you could not sell for the third straight year at the, in, in a row at the deadline. And you reward that effort with this kind of management. I don't get it. Like, if you're going to go for it, then go for it. I, I, I can't understand this. If you're going to bring Canario up and then not play him for five days, he's, he'd be doing much better service in Iowa. I, I, Question I, for you, Joe. It's yeah. it's going to be kind of a, a Sophie's Choice type of thing. Would you rather that the Cubs make the playoffs, which probably lets David Ross keep his job, or would you rather that the Cubbies drop out of the playoffs so that you can hopefully get rid of David Ross? I don't think he's going to get fired either way. So it really doesn't matter. I mean, the, the fact that you can, you know. Because I feel like a collapse like this, after the team bought in, after you're not using your players, I feel like a, if they were to collapse out of the playoffs – I feel like that would have to spell the end for David Ross. But again, it's the Cubs, so who knows? Here's the thing. They extended Ross into 2024 with an option for 25. I yeah. don't think he's going anywhere. Yeah, I, I, I don't challenge. see him going anywhere. If he were if he if he were to let's take the scenario where if they don't make the playoffs, he gets fired. Which scenario would you take? <laughs> Gosh. You know, I don't know. Um, you, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of Cubs fans talking about um, and different Cubs shows talking about all you have to do is get in. I mean, look at what the Phillies did last year. The, the, the Cubs have the talent to be there. I don't know that they have the organization to be there, if that makes any sense. Um, no, that makes a lot of the, sense, actually. The, the pitching – the pitching um, – Apparatus there is excellent. I mean, you have a ton of homegrown guys on this roster who are who are performing exceptionally well. Um, you know, I, I think if if there's a way to keep that and lose Ross, I would love it, but I, I don't think there is. So, you know, I, I want to win. Let's just put it that way. I mean, I think it comes down to yeah. that. I want to win. So yeah. if if winning is getting into the into the postseason and somehow getting to the NLCS, then I'll take it. If winning yeah. is getting in and re-signing Bellinger before the playoffs start, I'm in. But if you know if this is the kind of effort you're gonna put out, then why the hell would I watch the damn game? I get yeah. that. Um, Ron commented in the Cubs are stupid for keeping Ross. Yeah, they are. I've been on that train for three years now. <laughs> Since they hired him. I from I was gonna one, say only three. From day one, this was a bad idea, and I, I, I have said that from day one. It's just this is stupid. You yeah. don't bring a guy in because he's the sentimental favorite. I'm sorry, you don't. You need a man who can win this freaking games. 
and manages a team effectively and manages pitchers effectively. Um, you know, I, I'm honestly, I'm shocked that they let Steele go eight innings the way they've been managing pitchers, but you almost have to, if he's going to let you save your bullpen, you, you're going to let him throw as long as he can the yeah. way he's been pitching. So, I mean, it, it's, there's a lot to, uh, a lot to unpack there. There's a lot to think about. Um, sure. Yeah. The bottom line is winning cures everything, and that's that's the way you have to look at it. And you know, I I, I would obviously I care more about long term success because I don't think they're necessarily going to uh, make the World Series outside of something crazy. But you know, crazier things have happened. It's so happened. It, it just last year. I, yeah. Just, I just want to win. I don't care about the rest of it. And if you're going to say that you want to win, then then prove it. Yeah. All you have to do is get there. Yeah, Anything the, can happen once you get there. The, the, yep. the players have, have earned this, this being in contention the way they've played. Bellinger's been playing excellent. Swanson's been excellent defensively. I mean, I, honestly, I think that's the best middle infield in the entire league. Yeah, I wouldn't argue with it. I, you know with with Horner and and Dansby um, and even if you expand what you consider the middle of the field Bellinger in center or whoever is in center um, and Jan Gomes behind the dish has been excellent too okay okay if we're going to go the whole way then I am no. going to argue because we got a better catcher and we got a better center fielder than I'm, you do. I'm joking <laughs> I'm, I'm very so moving on. on anyway Joe, Joe, we don't need to let get, give Andrew uh, fuel to just start talking about the Braves again. Oh, but we haven't even gotten we, the we hot get, players and we, hot teams yet, Jason. We get, we get enough of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he is a part owner. We're used to it now. I know, part yeah, owner. Right. May as well just be a Braves podcast. I've been careful about that, actually. We haven't had anyway, too many rant over in the World Series. We haven't had too many completely pro brave podcasts. I've been very careful about that, <laughs> mainly because I'll never hear the end of it from you two if I don't. <laughs> I'll say you would probably soon be doing just a solo podcast. <laughs> nah, that's too much work. Or, or, or a po- or a podcast with Jay. Yeah, it would be fun. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> Joe, I feel for you though, man. That's that's frustrating beyond anything. Patrick Wisdom has no right to be in a lineup, and yeah, I, wh- whatever you can do to run Ross out of town, figure it out. And I wish you the best of luck with it because that's really the biggest cure the Cubs need right now. So. All right, let's roll it into the hot list. Speaking of which, um, Jason, who's your hot hitter this week? Uh, my hot hitter, um, yes, this will be a homer pick, but I have valid reason for picking it because um, I haven't really taken a hot player, hot hitter from the Phillies for a little while. Um, but Trey Turner, absolutely. Uh, one of the hottest players in the league right now. Uh, five straight games of a home run this last week, multiple times to either tie the game up or give the team a, a lead late. Um, and in his last seven games, He's hitting 414 with a 1.590 slugging percentage, um, six home runs, 14 RBI. Um, since that hit, that stay in ovation that the fans gave him, um, I'm not saying that the fans fixed Trey Turner, but the fans fixed Trey Turner. Um, he is hitting 362 with 11 home runs since that ovation. And he has raised his average from like a 230 to like a 262, 263 within the last month. Yeah, he's finally starting to play like the number one overall pick in the Dollar Dogs and Beer Fantasy Baseball draft this year. It's he, he's, pl- he, he's playing the – he's he's becoming the Trey Turner that the Phillies were expecting when they signed him. He yeah. is becoming the Trey Turner – he has been the Trey Turner that the fans thought they were getting. So, um, yeah absolutely uh has to be on the hot list right now all right and then for me um i'm also going to go homer but again it's justifiable acuna went 406 457 844 last week 13 hits two doubles four homers 11 rbis with a grand slam in there also four stolen base three walks two strikeouts and that's 
you know, that's just been showing that crazy trend this year that Acuna has had, that he has completely flipped around his um, strikeout ratio and increases walk ratio. So good to see all the way around. Um, Joe, do you have a hot hitter before your um, money ball hitter? Um, no, I'm just going to do them both in, in money ball, I think. Go for it. Um, I'm going to highlight, I think Luis Haraj had a good week, 462, uh, 500, 615 slugging, uh, 1115 OPS, seven runs. Scored 12 hits, one double, one homer, three RBIs, two walks, and a strikeout. Um, really seeing the ball well for, for the Marlins. Uh, and then the other one is Jordan Walker from the Cardinals. Um, only four runs, but he had 10 hits, two doubles, three homers, seven RBIs. Uh, his last time for the week, 556, 550, 1167, and OPS of 1717. That's pretty damn good. Yeah. You know, let's you know, let's remember Arias. He was chasing 400 for a period of time. Obviously, that's long gone. But he has a very commanding lead on the batting average lead in the National League right now. Uh, coming into games tonight, he was at 356. Tied at second, it's Freddie and Acuna at 335. That's a uh, good lead to have this late in September. So, <laughs> all right, uh, Joe, do you have separate money ball, or did you cover that? No, that covers it. Those two Perfect. guys, they were they were excellent. Perfect. All right, uh, hot pitcher. I'm going to go with uh, Blake Snell this week. Two and zero, oh, thirteen innings, seventeen strikeouts, an ERA of zero, and a WHIP of one point oh eight. He only allowed five hits. He did have nine walks, so that was a little bit uncharacteristic of him this past week, but still a solid week overall. Um, Jason, did you have an extra pitcher to add? No, I didn't really do a deep dive into the pitchers this week. Okay. All right, and then uh, Joe, uh, do you have a regular pitcher, or just the adulting? Just the uh, adulting reliever. All right, who's the adulting reliever of the week? Um, I, I want to give so there, there's two of these. One of them is for just the sheer the volume of, of pitching from him, um, Sir Anthony from the Phillies. He only got one win, and he was only had one save opportunity, um, but. Four appearances, three and two thirds innings, um, three hits, four strikeouts. Um, I, I thought he he pitched pretty well, give, getting them at least a chance um, to to stay in a lot of those games last week. Um, and then Emmanuel Classe from the Guardians, three for three and save opportunities, four appearances, four innings pitched, one hit, one run, one strikeout. Um, the whip for Sir Anthony was .82. The whip for Emmanuel Classe was 0.25. Excellent week. That's for that. healthy. 0.25 yeah. whip. Not the 0.82 is bad, but 0.25, that's that's nuts. All right, uh, Joe, who do you have for your hot team this week? Hot team this week is the Baltimore Orioles. 4-2 uh, and two in the last week, maintaining a lead on a surging <laughs> team that we'll cover shortly, I think. But um, – <laughs> It, it, they, they've just been excellent kind of staying staying ahead of of the race trying to to maintain a lead in that division so all right now jason about that uh possible other team uh yeah i took the Rays this week as my hot team uh sorry orioles fans uh, i i do hope that the orioles hold on to win uh that division i would love to see them go far in the american league um playoffs uh and as long as they're not facing the phillies in the world series i would absolutely be uh rooting for them to win the series um but yeah the tampa bay rays uh they are surging uh they are seven and three in their last 10 as well um because i believe the orioles are also seven and three in their last 10 right so so the orioles had a chance to really try and bury the rays this week and the rays are just like nah um, so seven and three, of the last 10, they are still now just two and a half, uh, back in that AL East race. It is going to be a dog fight to the end. Um, I it, it's the Orioles have to be damn near perfect, essentially the rest of the way, uh, in order to hold off this race team, I think. So hopefully they keep it going, but yeah, the Rays are absolutely on fire right now as well. The O's do have one advantage in that last series with Tampa Bay in Baltimore. They only need to win one game to hold the tiebreaker against Tampa. 
So that is definitely a huge factor in their favor since there's, again, no game 163 anymore. And also it makes more sense now why you didn't wear the O's jersey because good God, if you wore that O's jersey while saying all of that, uh, yeah. No. Yeah. We'll the end of that. No. All right. Um, I went with Atlanta for my hot team. Eight and two in the last 10. I uh, took three or four from the Dodgers in the road. Again, first time since 2012 they did that. Swept the Rockies. And they've just been hot lately. Two out of three from the Giants twice. Two out of three and three out of four from the Mets and swept the Yankees um, ever since their last uh, losing streak. So Atlanta is say, has basically said, all right, we beat the number two team in the NL. Uh, we're ready for the playoffs. Bring it on. All right, looking looking at the week up ahead, Atlanta's got a got an easier week. They need to take care of business. This needs to be a five to six, six to six week. Three with the Cardinals, and these are all at home. Three with the Cardinals, uh, TBD versus Nicholas tomorrow, Strider versus Hudson, Freed versus Wainwright, and then three with the Pirates, Elder versus Hatch, Morton versus Oviedo, and neither team has announced starters for Sunday. Um, yeah, if Atlanta doesn't win five out of six or six out of six this week, uh, there's something wrong because the Pirates and the Cardinals are trash this year. Um, the Cubbies, big week. Three with the Giants, Steel versus Webb, which they did take today, right? We saw they it. did, yeah. Five yeah. to nothing, yeah. Hendricks versus Walker tomorrow. Wicks versus Beck on Wednesday. And then four versus the Diamondbacks. Assad versus Giacconi, Tyone versus Galen, Steele versus Kelly, Hendricks versus Fat. So, I, damn Joe, th- this this is the make or break week for the Cubs. Honestly. Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's a lot to like about this week um, for them. I think um, getting a great start today, obviously, um, you like their chances with Wicks the way he's been pitching since he was called up, um, and uh, Javier Assad has been excellent too. Um, in a new starter role, so um, I, you know, I, they could they could sweep the Giants. I think that would be lovely. But two out of three is still good, um, and I think um, you know they have a chance in three of those games. Not sure about that that middle one. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the one to watch. And then the Phillies this week, three on the road at the Padres. Walker versus Hill, Lorenzen versus Avila, and Wheeler versus Wacha. At Waka, excuse me, and then three versus the Marlins, Sanchez versus Perez, Nola versus Cueto, Suarez versus Alcantara. Uh, Jason, does this feel like a trap week? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, these next, like this next week and a half, is so incredibly important um, that I'm trying to just prepare myself for a letdown because you know, as a Phillies fan, we're kind of used to that. Um, <laughs> Like last year was just absolutely special and magical. I'm not expecting them to do that again this year. Um, but they, as I check here, yeah, so they need to absolutely start off by winning tonight. Uh, after having that big of a lead, they need to be able to hold on to win this one. If they, if they end up losing this game, um, it will be an absolute backbreaking loss. Um, taking that for the, um, anyway. But, yeah, absolutely a trap week. You have the Padres on the road coming home against the Marlins, which is always just tough against the Marlins. So um, they need to beat these teams. They need to win two out of three um, each time or three out of four. You know, they need to be winning these series. Yep, it is too late into the year to not be taking series especially against sub 500 teams like the Padres. I was going to say it's against, against the teams that, that you're supposed to beat. Like I'm not, I, I'm not that upset that they lost the series to Milwaukee. Milwaukee is a good team. It was on the road. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, my problem with that was that they had games and gave them away. Um, And, but yeah, against the teams that you're supposed to beat, you need to beat them. All right, and then for the Orioles this week, uh, this is a week that they should be balling out and playing well. Three at the Angels, Rodriguez versus Rosenberg, Kramer versus Detmers, Gibson versus Sandoval, though that said, Kyle Gibson is showing like he did with the Phillies last year lately, so that's not a guarantee for them. Three at the Red Sox, Irvin versus Houck, Bradish versus Sale, and Flaherty versus Bellow. And 
like we said, the Red Sox very well could find themselves eliminated or pretty much on the brink by the end of this week because the Orioles are hot, the Rays are hot, and the Red Sox have to deal with both of them. So good luck, Boston. You're going to need it. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, anything else for the week? All right. We'll get this wrapped up so Jason can uh, go watch the Phillies end of this game. So, guys, um, audio recording. I, I don't know that I want to watch it. That's fair. That's fair. We've seen your bullpen. Audio recordings are available on Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcast, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else uh, you you can watch podcasts. You can see us live on YouTube, Facebook Live, and Twitter. Merchandise is at redbubble.com. You can follow us on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash dollar dogs and beer. Our Twitter handle is at DDAB underscore podcast, and we are all three still on there as well. I'm at PyroLord314. Jason's at jricker 300 Joe's at Jolton Joe 35 We are presented by Dark Arrow Podcast LLC, and we are sponsored by the Phenomenal Whiskey and Blade Barbershop in Lidditz. Uh, guys, may your dogs always cost a dollar. May your beer always be cold. Have a good week.